So it, as a very gentle way to ease into the second half of the semester, um, let's talk about diagonalization a little bit more. Um, because last time I kind of said very quickly, the halting problem is undecidable, blah, 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 diagonalization would work in the presence of an oracle, blah, 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 therefore it can't help us figure out, can't help us prove that P is smaller than NP. And, but I said this all kind of quickly. So um, I want to talk a little bit about diagonalization and the halting problem a little more. Um, so, so how many of you know how to prove that there are more real numbers between 0 and 1 than there, than there are integers? They're both infinite. One is more infinite, than, more infinite than the other. How many of you know how to prove that? Sort of. OK, well, let's prove this. You have a matrix. So, um, hmm. so <coughs> here's the idea. Uh, let's say, I, I, I'm going to, let's assume it's going to be a proof by contradiction. I'm going to assume that the number of real numbers between 0 and 1 is the same as the number of integers. OK? Well, if that were true, then there would be some way that I could match the numbers between 0 and 1 up with the integers. And I'm going to ignore the fact that point oh one 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 is the same as point one, just like point nine 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 is the same as one. I'm going to ignore that. Technical annoyance. Okay, going to throw it out the window. So, okay. So you come along to me and you claim that there's a way to match up the real numbers with the integers. Okay. Um, and uh, I say, OK, show it to me. And luckily, you and I are both as gods, so you can actually show it to me all at once. And then I say, oh, well, I claim that I can come up with a real number which is not anywhere in your list. But this violates your claim, because you told me that you had a way to match every real number between 0 and 1 with an integer. So I'm going to show you one that you forgot. So here's how I do it, and this is why it's called diagonalization. I'm going to go down the diagonal here, and I'm going to write down a new number which, where the ith digit is this digit flipped. Okay. So here's the, so to introduce a little bit of notation. Let's say that x sub i comma j is the jth digit of x sub i, the ith real number in the list. Okay. I'm going to invent a new number y such that y is x sub i comma i complemented. So in this case, y would be point zero, one, zero, zero, and so on. Okay. I know it will take me an infinite amount of time to write y down, but again, you know, you and I are, you know, let's assume that we both have these godlike abilities and that we're having this debate. Okay. Well, y cannot be the first thing in the list. Why not? Different. I mean, the first digit is different. Because it differs from the first thing on the first digit by design. Well, it differs from the second thing on the second digit and from the third thing on the third digit and so on. So y cannot be anywhere in the list. And what this says is that no matter how you try to match up real numbers with integers, there's always something missing. So you can't do it. So there must be more integers than there are real numbers. Uh, sorry, there must be more real numbers than there are integers. Any questions about this?
there's another version of this where instead of real numbers, we talk about <laughs> sets of integers. But it amounts to the same thing. So let's say that uh, you claim that the number of subsets of the set of integers, let's take the natural number 0, 1, 2, 3. You, cl you claim, so this is an infinite set. The set of all subsets of it is also an infinite set. I claim that the set of all subsets, the power set of the natural numbers, I claim that this is really bigger than the size of the natural numbers. They're both infinite. I claim this one is more so. To put it differently, people often use Aleph null to represent the size of the natural numbers. Well, then what's the size of the power set, the set of all subsets? Two to the Aleph. Two to the Aleph null. So <coughs> the claim is that this is bigger than that. So we do the same thing. Again, you have to agree with me that if, if two sets are the same size, it means that there's some way to match their elements up with each other. This is certainly true for finite sets, you know. So again, let's say that set 0, let's write down a 0 or 1. So let's say that s sub i comma j is 0 if the integer j is not in the set s sub i and 1 if it is in there. So, well, let's start naming sets. Well, there's the null set, the, the empty set, where nothing is in it. There's, I don't know, the even numbers. That's a set. There's the prime numbers. That's a set. There's the set of everybody. That's a set. OK. So you claim to have a complete list of all of these. And I say, here's one you forgot. Again, take the diagonal and flip it. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a new set, T. And T, uh, an element J is in T, if and only if J is not in S sub J. So my new set consists of 0, because 0 is not in the 0th set, and 1, because 1 is not in the 1th set. But I don't include 2, because it is in the 2th set, and 3 is in the 3rd set, and so on. And again, this can't be anywhere in the list, because there can't be any j for which t equals s sub j, because j is in t if and only if it's not in s sub j. So for all j, t differs from s sub j in that it has it contains j if s sub j doesn't, and vice versa. All right? Now, this is slightly mysterious. I mean, uh, and in, as a matter of fact, when uh, George Cantor gave this proof, he came under attack from some of the religious authorities at the time, saying that this was like polytheism saying that there were multiple orders of infinity. Um, and he had a long exchange of letters with some bishop that it would probably be a little bit hard for us nowadays to feel strongly about this exchange. Um, but uh, anyway, so he actually said, no, really what I'm doing is it's a much better picture of the divine because it's saying, well, the number of integers, it's infinite, but it's only the first step on an infinite, indeed, transfinite uh, hierarchy of greater and greater infinities. And the divinity is up there beyond all of these levels of infinity that we can conceive of. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, now, you know, I, I should say that this was controversial even among mathematicians. Because, you know, not just among bishops, because I said that well, you know, if you claim that there is such a correspondence and you show it to me, then I can go down the diagonal and give you something that you forgot. Well, uh, you know, this process of showing me the whole thing. Is that actually what? Yeah. Weird. 
This process of showing me the whole thing is a bit confusing. And it's certainly not a process which we can carry out in kind of finite time using finite resources. Um, and so people like the constructivists came along. And basically, the constructivists are mathematical conservatives. They say that I don't agree with you um, that, uh, I, I mean, conservatives in the classical sense. Um, they say, I don't agree with you that all these absurd mathematical objects that you'd like to talk about exist. I only believe that a mathematical object exists if you can show me how to build it right there in front of me. For instance, I only believe that sets exist if there's a way to generate their elements or, in the modern day, we would say, a way to compute to a, an algorithm that, given a number, tells me whether it's in the set or not. Well, how many programs are there? How many programs? Yeah. I mean, an algorithm is a program that can be written down in your favorite programming language. Yeah. And each program is a finite string. And how many of those are there? Finite. No. You mean? I mean, they could get longer and longer. But, I mean, up to now, currently. No, I, no I, I don't mean just the algorithms we've thought of. I mean, how many algorithms are there? Infinite. But which infinity? Should be anything you can conceive of. <laughs> well, I mean, a program, again, is just a finite string of symbols. Two, two. Well, what is an integer written out in decimal? It's also just a finite string of symbols, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you could take any program written in ASCII and you could interpret the whole thing as a huge integer, yes. right, written in base 256. So the number of programs is just this, this many. Simple. Yeah, so this is what people will usually call countable. <coughs> so the number of even numbers is countable. The number of rational numbers, it turns out, is countable. Our diagonalization proof shows that the, that the real numbers or the sets of subsets of the integers, that these are uncountably infinite. But the set of all programs is countable. If you, you know, because they're just finite strings. Each one is a finite string. Okay. Well, if an algorithm is a program, and if a description of a set is an algorithm for generating it or telling what the things are in it, then according to the constructivists, the number of different sets that we that really exist um, is only countable. So what they're trying to say is, look, I agree that the prime, the set of prime numbers exists in my mathematical universe. The set of, you know, the set of even numbers exists. But don't tell me about this crazy set of, this crazy list of all two to the aleph null sets, because the vast majority of these have no finite description. They have no name that we could ever write down. They have no definition we could ever write down, because that also would just be a finite string written in some alphabet, and there are only a countable number of those. And in particular, the vast majority of them have no algorithm which tells you whether things are in them or not. So, <coughs> um, I'm a bit more liberal than this. I mean, I think it's, I don't see any harm in saying that all of these sets exist and that this is big, more infinite than that. I mean, why not? You know, the sky doesn't fall when we say these things. Um, but it's interesting to note that the constructivist reaction to Cantor is part of what led mathematicians at the beginning of the 20th century to think about careful ways to recursively define sets and functions in terms of simpler ones. And this slowly turned into, by around 19 th the 1930s, what we now call um, computable functions. And and you know, including Turing's invention of the Turing machine in 1936, which became the von Neumann architecture for computers, which became the computers we have. 
So in terms of kind of the mathematical history of what we now call computation, it came partly out of the desire to understand, well, if we can't talk about all these sets at once, if we think this is too paradoxical, which sets will we talk about and how do we define them? So originally it was about how do we define functions and sets, but that sort of morphed into how do we compute them? So, um, <coughs> by the way, a nice exercise is prove that the number of, prove that the number of rational numbers is only countable. So figure out a way to <coughs> figure out a way to pair up the rational numbers with the integers so that every rational number has an integer so that that is a complete list of all of, all of the rational numbers. All right, anyway, so let's look at this. J is in T if J is not in SJ. Well, <coughs> suppose T is a barber and J is in the set T if J is one of the people that this barber shaves. Well, you've all heard this joke, right? I mean, the barber who shaves everyone who doesn't shave themselves. Well, um, this person is not in the list, so they don't have to shave, which as you probably know is the resolution to the puzzle. So, um, uh, um, right, anyway, so it's this kind of, this diagonalization is, it's this kind of standard snake biting its own tail <coughs> paradoxical kind of thing. Here it doesn't create a contradiction. I mean, we can define this, but it can't be anywhere in the list. Okay. So now let's look at something similar. <coughs> So now let's move forward to Turing. So um, as we were just saying, every program is an integer because you could take any integer, no matter how huge, and write it down in base 256 and convert that into ASCII and get a list of characters. The vast majority of them are gobbledygook, but some of them would be programs written in, say, C, which you could then compile and run. Okay, so I could make a table like this of all the programs and let's say that specifically these are programs which take a single integer as input. So here's the input. Okay. So now I'm going to write, I'm actually not going to pay attention to what the output is. I'm just going to pay attention to whether the program halts or not. So does it stop and give an output in finite time, or does it run forever pursuing some endless loop or floating off to infinity? Okay. So yes means, so uh, yes in the i comma j place means that program i halts given input j. Okay. So let's say that, you know, this halts, that halts, blah, blah, blah. Maybe program two always halts, that's certainly a possibility. Maybe program three never halts, that's certainly a possibility. All right, so, um, given a pair, i comma j, I could ask, will it halt? So, and as we talked about before spring break, this would be incredibly useful if your compiler warned you, your program will never halt. Okay? And not only could you check for it not halting for boring reasons, like you dropped a curly bracket somewhere and it's in an endless loop, but it could also tell you it will never halt for much more interesting reasons, like 
your program is looking forever for counterexamples to something for which there are no counterexamples, and then you could solve lots of unsolved problems in mathematics. Okay. So, well, if that's, if that's possible, then we could look at the special case, which I'll call um, D for diagonal. And what D sub i does is it returns, um, well, let's say that what it does is, <coughs> Let's say that um, d sub i returns 0 um, if program i halts on input i. So again, this is there's no contradiction about feeding a program to itself. The program is just a big finite string, or if you like a big integer, hand it to itself as input, see what it does. So that's like going down the diagonal. So let's say it's, uh, sorry, let, let's say it's 1 if it halts and 0 if not. So D is our hypothesized solver for the halting problem. Okay. Well, if this is possible, now I could invent a new thing, T sub i, which just says if D sub i returns 1, indicating that program i does halt on input i, then hang. Just go into some silly endless loop and never come back. If d sub i is 0, then halt. But what is this doing? It's exactly the same diagonal trick. It's going down this diagonal. And everywhere where we see a yes, because program 0 halts on input 0, we make sure that it hangs and doesn't halt. Everywhere where we see a no, because program 3 doesn't halt when given input 3, we make it halt and put a yes. So t cannot be anywhere in the list. So there cannot be any program which does this. But this program is just this program called inside a little if-then statement. So if we can't have this, it must mean that we can't have this. So again, it's exactly the same idea. And the result is that um, the result is that this program D cannot be in the list, which means, but this is a list of all programs. So there can be no such program. And so the halting problem is undecidable or uncomputable. There is no program which looks at other programs and tells you whether they will halt or not. Okay? So it's, any questions about that? It's kind of nice to know that uh, it's kind of nice to know that there's something a computer can't do uh, besides all the things you can think of, and this is one of them. Computers can't tell whether other computers will halt. Um, so let's let's take a let's take another let's take yet another look, look at this. So let's say that. Um, Let's invent a program called U. And what does this program do? It takes two things as input. <coughs> it takes um, a program given to it as the source code, as this finite string, and an input. And what does it return? It returns this. It returns what this program would do if given this input. What should we call this function u? I mean, what is it in the real world? Do we have such things? Do such functions exist in the real world? So. Yeah, well, it's like a computer, but on the software level, it's like an interpreter, right? So an interpreter is a program that you hand it another program, and it runs it for you. 
it simulates what the computer would do when running that program. And in so doing, it runs it. So I know that this might look abstract, but the, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit last time. Um, you know, up until, uh, up until the 1930s, there were very few times when anybody ever thought about building a device which does more than one thing. So people built machines to do a certain job. They even built calculating machines, but they built calculating machines to calculate logarithms or to calculate cannonball trajectories. And for each function they wanted to calculate, they built a machine to calculate that function. There's one exception to this, which is Charles Babbage. So Charles Babbage said, well, I want to build a general machine where you give me a description of the function you wanted to calculate, and it calculates it. So he was working in 1850, 1860. Um, he actually worked on this his whole life. His first thing he called the differential analyzer, and roughly what, what we would say is that if you, tell me, if you give me a differential equation, or like a recurrence, that it would solve that, okay? Up to maybe sixth order. And this machine was actually built, okay? So you can set on a bunch of knobs the coefficients of the different terms in the differential equation, and then you turn a crank, and it integrates that differential equation. So it's programmable to, an, to a point, but only if the thing you want to calculate is described by some differential equation. So then having done that, he said, well, you know, what about describing functions in a much, much more general way? As a program, as a list of instructions that says, take these two variables, multiply them together, put the result here, then increment that, then move it over here, then blah, 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 and do this until this other variable goes from zero to one, and then return that result. So this is, for all intents and purposes, exactly how we program today. It was clunky, it was, you know, very machine language-y, but it was universal. And um, Otto Lovelace is famous for having written, actually written down a fairly extensive program to compute a certain mathematical function which people were interested in at the time. So people often call her the first programmer. I guess he was the first hardware designer. Um, so unfortunately, building the, what he called the analytical engine, which could um, carry out these very general programs, this basically outstripped the mechanical engineering abilities of the day. There were too many gears that had to work too precisely, and there was too much friction and too much slippage, and it just couldn't be done. And he kept asking for more money, from the British government, and after a while they got mad at him, and everyone got mad at each other, and there are parts of it that exist, but the entire machine was never built. He was inspired, by the way, by something called the Jacquard loom. So the Jacquard loom was, let, let's say that you have a nice pattern that you want to weave into a rug. Well, the Jacquard loom was a programmable loom. You gave it a set of, um, yes, punch cards, and you may have heard from your great-grandmother or great-grandfather that they used to use punch cards in college. Um, well, that was originally the Jacquard loom. So this loom was something where you turn a crank and these punch cards come through, and it looks at which, you know, depending on where the hole in the card is, it weaves a bit of thread of one color or another into there, and it was a programmable loom. And so Babbage said, well, let's program more general things. And it's actually really, you can find all these things on the web. It's really fun to read what Otto Lovelace said about this. Um, she, said, she said a lot of things. So she said, she, she said one quote, which is often quoted sort of in the debates about artificial intelligence. She said, it can only do what we tell it to. It can't think of anything on its own which is something you often hear people say nowadays about computers, too. Um, she also says, well, we've designed it to do arithmetic and mathematical programs, but it could manipulate symbols as well, which is a pretty brilliant thing to say at the time. 
So she, basically she's saying, well, why limit ourselves to calculating functions with addition and subtraction and multiplication? The output here could be a symbolic output. It could do things like simplify expressions. It doesn't have to just deal in numbers. It can deal in what we would now call bits and strings. So anyway, that's all very cool. Um, but there's no evidence whatsoever that the people who were thinking about these axiomatic things having to do with recursive functions were thinking at all about Babbage. Okay. And even Babbage, as far as I know, never thought about an analytical engine running a program whose job it is to simulate another analytical engine. Mm -hmm. But if he had, he could have proved that no analytical engine can figure out whether another analytical engine will stop. Because this is true of any device capable of universal computation. Anyway, so there's some, William Gibson should write some novel about, you know, some alternate history he has. Um, anyway, <coughs> so what I, what I want to say is that this, this little equation here, when people, uh, when logicians first wrote it down in the 1930s was really profound because this is a function which can carry out any other function. You tell it what function to calculate and it does it. It's a universal function, just like our computers are universal computers in the sense that they have a program, if you like, or hardware, if you prefer, which can run any other program. But you can do this on the software level too. Of course, at the time, people weren't thinking about hardware and software in the way we do today. Um, all right, so here's, uh, here's something that I should point out. So we do have interpreters. This function, this program does exist, okay? So how about this function? I'll again call it T for trouble, although it's a different T than before. T takes the result that program P would, would give on itself as input and adds one to it. So let's again draw this table, except now rather than a table of Y's and N's for yes, it halts or no, it doesn't, let's actually write down numbers. Let's say that the zeroth program is the one which takes its input and just returns it unchanged. Let's say program one multiplies its input by two. Let's say program two adds three to its input and returns the result and so on, okay? Well now, what does this thing do? It goes down the diagonal and it says, well, what would program P do given P as input and adds one to it? One, three, six, and so on. Well, by this diagonal argument, it can't be in the list, but we know that there are programs which interpret other programs. So actually there is a program which does exactly this. You could write it. You could write a scheme program which does this. So where's the problem? Or rather, where's the contradiction and the contradiction that keeps this from being a contradiction? Why doesn't this tell us that, you know, I mean, I claim this is in the list somewhere, but the diagonal argument says it isn't. How do we escape, how does the snake, how does the snake escape its own bite? Did you never write down the whole list so you could never go across the diagonal? Mm, well, but I mean, remember, it, it differs from each row in a finite place, right? I mean, this does something, the argument goes that, well, this differs from program one because it does something different on input one. It differs from program two because it does something different on input two. The size of the input is finite, right? The input is different. 
Yeah. I don't know. Why can't I? Now I claim that you really can write this program. You hand it a string. It takes the string and it interprets it as a program. It interprets that program and the input it gives it is that same string. But then it adds one to the result. And adding one to the result, it seems, always makes the result different. Because the input of every time is different. Yeah. Like, you know that you're adding one, but the input of, of T is different from one to other. You don't always get a result. Yeah, because it's counted. Right. You don't always get a result. Right? So, I mean, taking the output of a program and adding one to it makes the output different unless it never halts and you never get any output. So, what's really going on here, I mean, I deliberately was obfuscatory in writing down numbers here, but you know that some programs never halt. So, for some of these things, there's a, let's call it, uh, I don't know, U for undefined or some symbol here meaning it never gave us a result. But in that case, there's no, it, in that case, this is also never gives any result, which means that it could be in this row. It, it could be this row. It could be this program. So again, diagonalization tells us something interesting. It tells us that any programming language in which you can write an interpreter, so which I'll say, any language which can interpret itself, there are programs that never halt. So, I mean, you might sit down and say, well, gosh darn it, I'm tired of my programs never giving me a result. I'm going to invent a new programming language. For instance, I'm going to get rid of this pesky while loop. Okay? If I only, if I only use for loops, for loops that I, I don't use perverse side effects like changing the limit of the loop once I'm inside it, if I only use for loops that every time I enter a loop, I know in advance how many times it's going to run, and then it's going to go down to the next part of the program. And I'm, I'm not, I'm certainly not going to use something as uh, horrible as a go-to to jump back to previous places in the program. I'm going to invent a program where every program, a, a language where every possible program you can write always halts. Well, you can do that. But such a program is not capable of writing an interpreter. Such a programming language does not have an interpreter for itself. You can't write an interpreter for programs in that language, in that language. Because if you could, you would get a contradiction using this. So, for instance, <coughs> I talked about getting rid of while. So, a loop program Um, is written just in terms of uh, for loops. And I mean kind of vanilla for loops. Things that say for i equals 1 to 100 and where i does get incremented every time so that you only do the loop 100 times. It's okay if, you know, you could have it call some other function g and so the program for the function f could say for i equals 1 to g of x. That's okay. But it's still <coughs> true that once you enter it, you're going to halt sometime, sometime. And you even kind of know in advance how long that will take. So this is a kind of limited programming language. And it turns out that the things that it can do are what are called primitive recursive functions. And um, 
it turns out that there are functions that you can do with the programming languages that we enjoy using, which include while loops, which no loop program can compute. So, I mean, if you're looking at your favorite programming language, you might ask yourself, which things can you get rid of and still have fundamentally the same computational power? Well, if you got rid of so much so that you only have this sort of for loop and you know that you, you know therefore that every program will halt, your language is no longer universal and in particular you can no longer write an interpreter for it. And um, one way to see this is that so what would this what would this interpreter do? Um, you hand it a program as input and it has, you know, a couple of nested for loops. <coughs> okay. So you are trying to write a program in this for loop language which interprets and runs other programs written in this for loop language. How is it going to work? Well, what an interpreter would actually normally do is it would say, you know, it would just run a little program that says, okay, at the moment, I'm on this line of code. I'm about to, exer I'm about to execute this line of code. Here's the values of all my variables. Oh, it says I should increment i. Okay, I increment i, and then I go down to this line of code. And it jumps around from one line of the program to the other according to whatever the control flow of the program is, and it updates its variables as it does it. But what kind of loop does the interpreter need to have to handle any such program? Recursive. Well, it, it could, yeah, re, re, it could have recursion or, I mean, recursion is sort of a, a disguise here for a while loop, right? How long does the interpreter need to run? Well, until the program it's interpreting halts. If you know in advance how long that will take, you could use a for loop for that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know in advance how long that will take, you need a while loop. Another way to put this is that if you want to interpret programs with one for loop, you need two nested for loops. If you want to interpret things with two nested for loops, you need three nested for loops, and so on. But if you want to be able to interpret arbitrary programs in this loop language, then your interpreter needs to have an arbitrary number of levels of for loops, but that's impossible. But it can wrap all of those up with a while loop. So let me give you, so there's one example of a program which you can write with while that you can't write just with for. Let me give you another one, which is kind of nice, called the Ackerman function. So there's lots of variations on the Ackerman function. Um, here's, here's basically the idea. So you can do this. You can increment something. But if you did this... Um, <coughs> y times, what do you get? X plus, y. X plus Y. Well, if you do this, um, now let's say you do this to itself, Y times, you get X times Y. And if you take X times itself, Y times, you get X raised to the Y. And if you do that to itself y times, actually you need to do the parentheses the other way to make this interesting, then you get this y times. Well, and then you could do this to itself y times. And that would be something else, which is really, really, really big. So um, let's... Let's call plus, plus zero. And let's call times plus sub one. And let's call exponentiation plus sub two. And let's call this, whatever the heck it is, some people call it tetration, plus sub three. And 
So give me an interesting function based on all this using the diagonal idea. Uh, x plus sub x. x. X or something. Or this could even be 2. Okay. So this function grows very, very quickly. It's bigger than any exponential because by the time x is 3, you're already doing stuff like this. But it's even bigger than any function you can write down like this by the time x equals 4. <laughs> so I mean, this function... This of 4 is probably, you know, bigger than any number of which we can conceive. Basically, you need one for loop to do this, two nested for loops to do this, three nested for loops to do this, and so on. And to do this in general, no finite number of for loops is enough. So if you want to write a program to calculate this, it's not so hard to write the program. <laughs> It's just it will take a very long time to run, and your computer will explode. You can, the, the source code, however, is very simple, but it has a while loop in it. Or it uses recursion, which you can use to do a while loop sort of in disguise. So it's kind of fun that you can, so, so what this says is that the set of all computable things, um, which we showed the halting problem is outside, that set of functions, right? This says that what you can do with these simple loop programs, these primitive recursive things, they include pretty much almost everything that we actually ever do with a computer. I would argue can you can do it with for loops. Because every time you have a while, if you have some bound on how many times the while is going to run, if it's ever going to halt, you could replace it with a for loop if you wanted, if you knew that in advance. Um, and yet, this is a proper subset of that. And way down here, we have P and NP. Um, okay, good. Um, so, uh, we talked last time about Gödel's theorem and the fact that there are theorems which assert that they themselves cannot be proved and that these things must be true. Um, I just want to, I, I think I'm going to end early today, but I, I know you'll hate me for that. Um, it's, you know, it's all, there's all this sun coming down outside. There's ducks in the duck <laughs> pond. I, I'd much rather stay in here, too. <laughs> but... Um, I'm, I'm running out of material before my next natural break point. But um, I want to leave you with this. Okay, so without commenting on the question of whether or not Santa Claus exists, um, let's just try to see if this is a valid proof that he does. So this sentence says that if it's true, and it may or may not be, then Santa Claus exists. Um, and of course, in this case, the phrase, this sentence, that's the diagonal thing, right? That's the thing pointing to itself. Um, do you think the sentence is true? I'm not asking you if you think Santa Claus exists. I'm just asking you if you think that the sentence is true. Can you? Well, let's see. I mean, it's either true or it's false, right? Yeah, it has to be true. Um, well, another way to write this is, um, so... Well, let's see. Uh, let, let's see what happens if it is true. Okay. okay? Let's assume that it's true. Mm -hmm. Exists. Yeah. Well, if it is true, then Santa Claus exists. Mm -hmm. But that's what it says. Mm -hmm. It says if it's true, then Santa Claus exists. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true. Yeah. And therefore he exists. <laughs> This is a very handy way to prove things. 
there's something you're having trouble finding a proof of, just write this down. Um, I mean, we can also try to show that uh, it, it can't possibly be false. So let's see. Um, it is false. Well, if it's false, that doesn't mean Santa Claus doesn't <laughs> exist. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, well, I like our first proof first. Yeah. So, all right. Um, oh, one more. Uh, well, two more. Sorry. The ducks are calling, but not loud enough. So, so um, let n be the smallest number which cannot be defined with less than <laughs> 13 words. Well, okay, this is called the this is called the Berry paradox. And uh, well, what does what is what is this what does this 12 word definition of n tell us? Oh, there's a contradiction here, but so you know, if, if you're philosophically inclined, you want to wrestle with this contradiction and really understand how to get out of it. And presumably, the way to get out of this contradiction, um, the way to escape the diagonal trick in this case, is to say that this phrase, what can be defined, is very hard to capture. Right? It says somehow that definability is such a vast concept that you can't fit it into just a few words here and then turn it on itself. Um, to put it differently, this is a little bit like saying, uh, you know, writing a program that uses an interpreter, and then it tries to calculate the simplest function which cannot be written with less than a thousand lines of code. But if that using the inter you calling the interpreter as a subroutine or something, so that the whole thing is less than a thousand lines of code. Well, what would happen is somehow the program would hang, right? It would just never get back to you. And that's how it would escape. It would escape the contradiction by never, give, by never speaking to you again. And somehow the idea is that, well, you can't just play with the general definition because some definitions, you try to write them down and you just get, you know, nonsense or something which is undefined. I don't know. I'm not a philosopher, but I think that's sort of what's going on here. Um, and we'll do one more. So the number one is clearly very interesting, right? I mean, you know, what can you know? Multiplied by anything is the same thing. Number two is the only even prime. What could be more interesting than that? Number three, well, it's the first odd prime. Two, four is kind of interesting because I don't know. Two plus two equals two times two. And five, I'm sure there's lots of interesting things about five. So, you know, at some point we'll get to the smallest uninteresting number. <laughs> but that's pretty interesting. <laughs> okay. Go, go feed the ducks. <laughs> I'll see you Thursday. Uh, Dirac once said that uh, 17 is the smallest arbitrary integer. Although 17 is pretty interesting. I mean, it's a prime which is a power of 2 plus 1. Those are very good. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I just got chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 like, so, 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 did you forget to wear sunscreen? I know you had sunscreen. It's cold. It's actually worse because it reflects back on the I don't know. But then I do I was trying to do the next one. In Mount Yorna sunglasses, I strained my eyes and I wear them like a normal thing. Yeah. Like they block out. They don't seem like they do. I wear those. So I was skiing. I was skiing. I need sleep too. I slept on all that. I was so angry at the lift. I played with the scheme. So it's like a dozen times a year before years and then fall off the lift. But I did one blue one. Yeah, I, didn't, I, I didn't follow that. For your first time, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I didn't do any black ones. They look really yeah, scary. Yeah, they're really good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have, like, humps every day. It's only green ones, Bob, and the ones that are the roads that go back and forth like that, you know? Yeah. Okay. I don't like those anyway. Why? Even when I, was, when I learned to ski years ago. Why? Well, because they're usually really narrow, and there's no room to turn. But they do the turning point. They do the turning point. I was going to say, sometimes the blues are better anyway. I skied until I busted my knee twice and <laughs> snowboarded. Snowboarding is better? Yeah, it doesn't hurt my knees. Because there's no way that your your one can go this way, oh, and yeah, go I this way, you know. I'll never do snowboarding. Nailed to a board. God, it's so hard to walk in skis. I never thought it would be that oh, yeah. hard. In skis? Yeah. Hard in boots. <laughs> what, <just> <laughs> boots? <laughs> the boots are bad. Boots <laughs> I do telemark skiing, and so so I can do backcountry stuff where you yeah. have to hike up the mountain in skis. So my skis have old fish scales on the bottom, so I can't slide backwards. Oh, you skin up the mountain. Yeah. Nice. And uh, I, I uh, demoed some uh, some new skis like on Saturday, and uh, so these guys are gear reps, right? And they have these new skis. Yeah. And I go to get in the lift line, and I'm like sliding backwards, and I can't go the little slope to get the lift line, and they watch me like, it's gonna kill herself. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. How much do skis cost? Oh, I just bought a pair for hundred and eighty dollars. You, you can pay the bindings are used. as much as you want for skis. Yes, yeah, so you can pay a couple grand or I mean it's like bicycles, you know. You can right. pay a couple grand for a bicycle if you wanted to. Um, Actually it's not really like bicycles because you can't go to Walmart and buy a sixty dollar pair of skis. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> Did you get a season pass? Uh well, for last year I did the Santa Fe San Diego season pass, but yeah. it's like four hundred and fifty dollars yeah. if you buy it in August. And so what happens if you don't buy it in August? Uh, the price goes up. I don't know what it is, like six hundred eight hundred. So it's absolutely insane. We should all live in Colorado mm -hmm. because their season tickets are like two hundred bucks, yeah. but we don't. So <laughs> we have supper, and uh, so this year we got this. It's called a New Mexico X card. Yeah. You get like. Six lift tickets for a hundred dollars, but each one's at like a different place. Oh, so it's like we'll so Oh hey, uh free skiing at Angel Fire Friday. on Friday. If you skip out of class, I'll skip out of class. Actually it depends on my project proposal. Uh, wait, so what is Angel this? Fire free on Friday, it's free. free for New Mexico residents. Where is Angel? I'm not a resident of New Mexico. Uh, if you have a utility bill, you can show that. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't need that. Your driver's license is in New Mexico. Uh -huh. No, utility bill will work. What, so who are these? What is this? Angel Fire? Where's Angel Fire? I don't know. Near Taos. Eagle's Nest. You know what Eagle's Nest is? <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're having the free deal, because no one knows where it is. <laughs> have you ever been? 
Well, people know where it is because it's one of the so. snowboarders' favorite places usually. Oh, yeah, that's true. I mean, if you're not going to, well, now Taos is open, but right. until Taos opened, it was, it was this snowboarders' area up there. Right. You got like two half or something. So. Right. Yeah. But it, it is. I've heard it's decent. That's yeah, so I've been to like every ski area in the state because we keep getting these, the, the cheapest lift tickets you can get are the ones that give you like 10, 10 lift, no, the first year it was eight of them for like $150. Ah, that's not bad. Well, that's pretty fun No, though. it was two at each area, so it was 16. But you drive a lot. Yeah, I know. So it's kind of like, a that's why last year we actually did the Santa Fe one yeah. for like 450 bucks, then you could ski Sandy and Santa Fe all you want. See, we usually just go up to Colorado a couple times. Oh, we do that too. But the, the New Mexico X card, like they change which ski area it is every uh, year too. And this year included uh, Monarch. Oh, Monarch's nice. I like Monarch. And uh, A Basin. Monarch's in Colorado. Which, yeah, I know. So, and the other things on the ticket are like Angel Fire and Taos and Durango. Well, Durango's in Colorado too, but. Purgatory? Yeah. And yeah, they changed the name. They don't like you calling it. Someone doesn't like That's where that. I went last week. That's where I demoed my skis. Nice. And that's why after that, I went and bought a new pair. Oh. Skis now. So I should not do that. Gotta get skins for them, though. So you can walk up small. I got holes. skins. Oh, okay. I mean, if I'm actually walking up hill, I still put the skins on anyway. Yeah. yeah, they're just like, uh, well, they're like fur, like the little furry thingies on it, just stick down one way. You would just start like glue it on the back of your ski. But you can take it off and put it on a different pair of skis? If they fit. Oh, okay. I, I mean, you, when you buy them, it's just this long strip of material that's about as wide as a ski, oh, right? Okay. And you cut it to the length of your ski. It's got a loop on the front end that you hook over the tip, uh -huh. and then a clip on the back. Does it interfere with your normal skiing downhill? Yeah. Uh -huh. So when you get to the top of the mountain, you pull them back off. Oh, so that's a pain. I guess not if it takes you, like, you know. Yeah, the pain is how long it took you to climb up there. Because we've done this on Sandia Peak, mean, and it takes us like an hour and a half. You don't mind spinning five minutes. When the lift takes legs. you like five minutes. Right. Why don't you use the lift? Sometimes it's not open. Like during a full moon. Oh, that's a long time. I, I did it once. I felt so really that's stupid not when I did it. Wall. No, it's not. It's, it's national uh, forest land, it's public land. In fact, you could always snowboard at Taos, too, if you're willing to walk up. <laughs> I've oh, seen really? people do it. <laughs> yeah, they don't walk like right up the, the slope, usually. There's another, no, that's in Santa Fe. Or something. I don't know how they do it. But I've seen snowboarders at Taos. But you, you basically As like a publicity run. stunt. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll just pick the left. Yeah. Well, normally I would, too. I mean, the first time I did this at Sandia where we walked up was to try out my new skins. And I felt really stupid doing it when the lifts were open. And you see the same people coming down, coming down, and you're still walking up. And I've seen other people doing it at Sandia. But we did it like a month ago for the full moon. And, uh, yeah, there's no other way. It's just like going for a hike in the snow. Uphill. <laughs> All right. That's exciting. I've done it at Mount Taylor, no lifts there. I love Mount Taylor. I've skied it a few times. Is that the tallest mountain? Uh -oh. No, Mount Wheeler is. Oh, it would have been. Taylor's one. You know where Taylor is. Oh. I think I camped one time there during the winter. At Mount Taylor? Yeah. Oh. It's the one you can see out west. It's 11,300 feet. Is it? That is pretty tall. But Wheeler's 13,000. Oh, that's when I learned I hated snow camping. <laughs> Well, for my spring break, we decided to go explore the canyons in Utah. Oh, how was that? Canyon lake? It snowed. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> and you know how the trails work there? You hike up the bottom of the canyon. There's no trail. You just hike the, the uh, you know, the, the canyon, right. the, the creek bed. Uh -huh. So there's like a couple inches of water. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we actually, we drove, well, after skiing at Durango, we went to Escalante, actually not Canyonlands, because we couldn't take Escalante, and we're sitting at the trailhead, like after driving down this muddy road, and uh, realizing that we're going to have to walk through it, not much water, a little bit of water, but our feet would be wet the entire time, and yeah. it's snowing. Oh, that'd be cold. And decided we were too wussy for that. We had our backcountry permit and everything, and the ranger was like, well, the weather might not be so nice today, but it'll be great the next few days. We're like, the snow's not going away. <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. Uh -huh. <laughs> So, <laughs> got back in the truck and we drove south. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's like... Through the snow! So <laughs> I hit Sedona. I mean, the snow's not as bad if it's not also wet, but like the wet and the snow. Yeah, and I could put up with it if it, I knew it was just that night, because I've done that before, where I knew, like, just the way my schedule worked, I had to start backpacking in a hailstorm or something like that. Oh. And I was going to put up with the bad weather that night, and it would be gorgeous the rest of the time. But not when you're going to start the hike with your feet wet. Yeah. We didn't really think about that. So, so yeah, we went to Sedona, where it was still snowing, even in Sedona, but at it least... It wasn't uh, as wet. It was not as wet. At first, they didn't think it was that wet. But we still got... They had a creek that, I mean, it was like waist high where we would have had to go. We had to cross it a couple of times. Oh, okay. Which isn't On the time. too bad. I can deal with that. I know. It's higher. They said it's higher than normal. And there was, according to our trail map, there's another place where we're going to have to cross it, and then we can find our little our loop trail that bring us back oh, and yeah. go over a mountain, basically. We got there, and it seemed like we crossed the river sooner than we should have. And then the trail went back the other way over it. Oh, so no. we're not supposed to be doing that at all. And there's other people going, what the hell's going on? And this other guy who, uh, I don't know, looks like he'd been out there a while. <laughs> he had to cross about four more times. My friends got tired of going in the trail and the creek in the trail, so they just walked down the creek, waist high. <laughs> in my runoff, like freezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you go in. Like, ah! Actually, you wouldn't feel anything when you went in. It was when you came out. Wait, like, how would you dry your clothes? Well, I, I didn't need to. I wore my sandals. Well, wasn't it like freezing? Yes, it was freezing. Uh, Only for the first couple seconds, then you can't feel your feet. You can't feel anything. In fact, the first there. day I did it because it actually was still snowing on us a little bit when we started. You know, just a little bit of snow. But uh, but it, it got sunny by the time we crossed that creek, I think. I go in, and my feet are so numb, like I had to like stand on a rock in the middle so I could feel them again to finish crossing. Oh. But at least I had sandals on, but... Uh, I think that part it was deep enough we, uh, I, I crossed without my pants on so that I wouldn't have to dry them. I don't think I crossed the cold runoff stream more than that deep. Well, we didn't have much, well, we had a choice. This was five miles and we could just turn around and walk uh, out. Oh, okay, I see. And, and it, it, it was... Exciting? Refreshing? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit refreshing. <laughs> the worst part was for my husband because he carried the dog across. Oh. <laughs> he doesn't like to swim. And he doesn't, I mean, it was flowing, and so he doesn't really know how to deal with the current. What kind of dog doesn't like to swim? I know, he's weird. He's like a cat. He, like, he walks around puddles so he doesn't get his feet wet. He hears a sprinkler. He, like, tries to cross the street to avoid it. He is, he's like a cat. But, I mean, he'll cross a creek if he has to yeah. when we're hiking, but he doesn't really know how to deal with the current. So, so, we, so we picked him up and carried him across, and uh, then had to come back for his pack. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sound awesome. dog on his shoulder. He's all. Oh, you guys are hardcore. <laughs> oh, gave up on you, Thompson. Not that hardcore. <laughs> Well, we got to the part where it looks like we're just going to have to walk like a half mile upstream in waist deep water, and we just, we didn't do our loop, we just went back out the way we came. So, we tried to do, go up another like side canyon, but there, the creek there was so, it was just completely dry and there's no water. Uh -huh. So you can't spend like, you know, more than a day out there. Right. So it was real frustrating. We couldn't leave this creek that was overflowing because we needed the water from it, but it was blocking our trail. Mm -hmm. But it was fun. I spent five days doing that. Cool. What did you do? Sit around doing work? I didn't do any work. You didn't? You said you were going to work like 15 hours a day. I lied. I did not do I, I did not do anything. It was awful. It was Really? Well, no, no, it was like great. It was great. It's awful now. Yeah, well, I was <laughs> up till like 3 a.m. doing my stats homework, and it's just stats homework, too. You know, it's not like... Did you finish it? I had the solutions. The solutions aren't that obvious, though. The solutions are like, what the hell? You know. What, so when's, that, when's that due? Yesterday? No, it was due. At, yes, it was due at eleven this morning. If I had a project proposal to write yesterday, so I spent like Saturday and Sunday working on that and proofreading it on Monday before I turned it in. What do you do for projects? I I'm gonna have to talk to him about it because I might be completely like. 
It's not anything I talked to him about before. The stat project? No, I machine learning. Oh. Oh. Whatever do you mean? The final project. I'm trying to improve the ACL score. I think it has a problem when you have uh, the data like we have the fMRI data where uh, you sometimes you know, it's based on counting the number of events, but the numbers of the events can be like a thousand, or they can be like five in, in the same data set. So comparing like apples with bananas. Uh, yeah. How is how's that class been so far? And I, I hope it, what the advanced machine learning. So it would, all we do is read articles and discuss them. Huh. So and it's a little bit weird because some people survey has different backgrounds. So. Oh, I see. Is Deepak still uh, still moonlighting? Usually, but not every day. Okay. For the first half of the semester or whatever, for a while, he's there every single day. But he's always doing stuff on his computer. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Like in colloquium. Yeah. Oh, he like does that there too. It's all like. <laughs> He brings his mouse with him, and then he doesn't want to sit at the table during uh, machine learning. So he's got his laptop it, literally in his lap, and his mouse keeps like falling on the floor. But you know, he's got a little USB cord and keeps pulling back up again. But <laughs> you're like, just take them. You're not using the damn mouse. <laughs> Chemistry lab. So the problem with deciding I'm going to fix the ACL score is that. Uh, Taryn knows a lot more about it than I do, so I can easily look like a real idiot because I didn't talk to him first about it. Right. I talked to him about two other ideas I had, and the one wasn't working out, and the other one just was boring me as I thought about it. What was that one? The one that was boring? Yeah. Oh, just comparing different learning algorithms. 